Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to today's uh, webinar. My name is Silas Rotich, a CTTRP trainee and a graduate student at the University of Alberta. Our speaker today is Dr. Donna Wall. She is the section head for the blood and marrow transplant stroke cell therapy program, the division of hematology and oncology at the Hospital for Sick Children. She's also a professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Her research has focused on improving the outcomes of children undergoing transplant through a better understanding of the role of the innate immune system and the interaction between donor immune cells and their new environment, both during the establishment of hematopoiesis, stroke tolerance, and as a tool to treat leukemia. She also works with the entire uh, PL. PMTCT program on half clinical trials, uh, exploring gene therapy trials for immunoglobinopathies and chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy for child, childhood acute uh, leukemia. So today's topic is clinical trials in pediatrics, PMTCT, a trial designed for small and heterogeneous cohorts. You're welcome, Dr. Donna. Well, thank you so much for the, the kind words, and it's, it's uh, truly a pleasure to uh, be able to speak with the CDTRP uh, trainees. The, um, and uh, in preparing for this talk, I, sort, I tried very much to riff towards um, something that would be of interest to the uh, more solid organ and donor uh, community. Um, the um, uh, the, at Sick Kids, we have a, an active uh, bone marrow transplant cell therapy uh, program uh, covering the gamut of, of um, both malignant and non-malignant disorders that can be um, treated with um, replacement of the hematopoietic system. Before I get started, I do have a few disclosures. I'm a, an investigator on uh, Novartis-sponsored trials for tisogen leclusol and um, uh, ruxolitinib. Um, we are also an investigator for um, the uh, gene therapy uh, trial looking at correcting uh, hematopoiesis in patients with thalassemia and sickle cell disease, and uh, currently president of Cell Therapy Transplant Canada, formerly known as the Canadian Blood and Marrow Transplant Group. Um, the objectives of this talk is, are to um, introduce sort of three, I sort of took liberty on, on, on my assignment, um, and to uh, to talk about three uh, areas that uh, that I thought might might pique your interest. Um, the first is to introduce the concept of pragmatic trial design for phase three trials, and and uh, run through in detail a trial on um, that uh, I thought was an outstanding example. Uh, then I'd like to talk to touch on um, how how we can improve a phase one clinical trial design. Um, in uh, or in both organ and uh, bone marrow transplant, and and some of these unique issues that we're currently dealing with in our in our trial design, and then uh, finish up with a, a trial that I'm very excited about um, uh, that uh, is supported by the CDTRP, uh, looking at uh, uh, stable mixed chimerism post hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, and this trial is designed specifically to um, uh, be a model for establishing uh, tolerance in solid organ transplant. Uh, speaking for our program, but also um, the programs that everybody in the room is uh, involved with, is there are the organ tra the transplant programs are complex. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of uh, a lot of um, people involved in in delivering the end result of a functioning organ, one, one organ for life. This is what our program looks like, and it involves four separate clinical teams, and of course, at the center of the patient and the family. Um, we have a lot to make this work. We have a lot of quality uh, initiatives and um, policies and, and then for our program, but then we're also nestled within sick kids, uh, and I could pay put one more uh, bigger circle out there and that being you know Health Canada, the various regulatory provincial bodies. 
So when we look to improve uh, treatment on, on patients, um, we've got a lot of what I call stakeholders. If we change one thing in the blue box, that's going to have ripple down effects in many other um, areas. And this is, this is what makes um, uh, trial design, um, uh, sort of basically studying ch our change, proposed changes um, uh, incredibly complex in, in our fields. The, um, um, you, I could change the words m minimally here and have this, um, uh, p this arrow and um, boxes apply to solid organ transplant as well as bone marrow transplant or cell therapy. Um, we are, our care is not just the, you know, the day of the organ transplant or the day of the bone marrow transplant, but there are a lot of pieces that feed into uh, pre-transplant optimization, optimal donor identification, and then post-transplant um, care. And this is just to remind me that our goal no longer is just survival from the transplant or the organ replacement, but it's that our, our bar is now to return our uh, patients to a, a full, uh, full life. So to study this and to understand this, um, uh, we have um, basically a continuous uh, and a comprehensive quality program that we, we use as a, a platform to study improvements. Uh, institutionally, we have a, a Caring Safely program, as which several, several uh, centers um, have uh, their own version of it, but basically very careful monitoring of infections and um, uh, culture of um, please report things that don't go well as well as things that do go well so that we can improve our processes. Because our business in bone marrow transplant is, is about the cells, about getting the cells to function or to um, provide hematopoiesis, we have taken uh, the approach of doing a 360 review um, of all graphs that are uh, given to, uh, to, to patients. And we identify anybody who, any recovery post-transplant that is longer uh, than we expect or didn't work um, as, a, um, as a, a full review with all those uh, different teams who were, whose hands touched that product um, going back and looking at the product. Um, and uh, we uh, trend that. This identifies areas of uh, potential improvement. Um, I'd like to spend some time on this talk to, uh, to uh, talk about a, a study that's been developed in Alberta that I think is a really good example of studying improvements. And to show you the complexity of what's involved uh, with what looks like intrinsically probably the most simple study that you could do. Um, and the, uh, the um, it, so this is um, a, an Alberta wide um, trial um, is anybody on the call? I, I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't see anybody doing anything. I'm. I'm just. Um, afterwards, I'd be interested if anybody on the call is is involved with this trial. Um, but the I, the question is a very simple one. The transition from pediatric to adult care is often bumpy. It involves um, um, a lot of changes for the patients who have been under the watchful eye of their parents um, have had the pediatric teams taking um, a very motherly approach um, um, or paternalistic approach where we really don't ask, we tell. And, um, um, and there's really not a lot of choice, you know, a lot of choice for the individual. Um, and a, a a transition to a care team that's different than the care team that you've been really closely working with for, um, you know, for many years. So the idea is very simple that a patient navigator at this time of transition, so basically somebody who will, uh, you, that you know by name, who sits down and talks about issues and helps you identify what your, um, you know, is, helps you with your first visits and gets you, yeah, uh, into this, into the care adult care system, whether hiring such a person as part of the institutional institution. So this is for organ transplant, but also anybody who's chronically ill. 
um, whether having navigator will uh, reduce all cause emergency room and urgent care visits, uh, whether um, it will improve transition readiness scores, and that's, that's uh, called a track survey, uh, a uh, standardized survey uh, that um, um, has been validated for transitions of care, um, and also improve uh, patients' fee, um, interpretation of their health status, and finally uh, generate cost savings to the system. So it's a very simple 300 patient um, trial of kids transitioning from um, pediatric to adult care uh, with a randomization between usual care and, and, that, and receiving a navigator. Um, a couple of uh, uh, interviews at the beginning, at the end, um, and, and then uh, read out on uh, the standardized scores and your um, healthcare utilization. This is a um, this type of trial is called a pragmatic clinical trial uh, design. And pragmatic, when you see it, it's broadly defined as a trial whose purpose is to inform decisions about practice. So it's not so much a it's whether this treatment is better or worse for a, a given indication, but it's once you move past that and you say, I'm moving into practice, does this improve um, our um, uh, practice of medicine? And um, there, there, there has been some, um, a lot of, uh, some work and so, a lot of it's, I was surprised when I was preparing for this is, you know, based in the Canadians have had a strong input in a pragmatic trial design. And what's the difference with a pragmatic trial design over a standard randomized phase three trial um, of you know, a drug or a certain organ uh, immunosuppression or whatever? The question is different on the level of efficacy. So a standard trial would look, does this intervention work? Um, and the uh, versus a pragmatic trial is one where does the intervention work when it's used in normal practice? The setting uh, is different rather than uh, in the you know, fully you know, controlled um, clinical trial settings that we have with our clinical trial units. Here, our setting is in normal practice. Participants, the difference here is that there's very little eligibility or ineligibility uh, basically, it's anyone who's, in this case, transitioning care. Um, the intervention in a pragmatic trial has more flexibility built into it because it, it has to fit with normal practice. The outcomes are, are subtly different and broader because now we're um, asking, do patients feel better or participants feel better or, or and it, what's the participants? interpretation of this, uh, of this intervention. Uh, funders, our provincial health agencies, um, uh, the communities and the healthcare providers. Um, and the relevance to practice here is the idea is at the end of this trial that we're going to have information that is going to help uh, make decisions about treatment options. Okay, so the, the aim of this phase three trial is to say yes, uh, navigators make a difference and let's fund them as part of our health care budget or no, they, they don't make a difference. So this study uh, design is, it's a randomized trial, okay, and so th there'll be a flip of a coin with whether patients get a um, navigator or not, but it's not blinded as to whether this, um, the subjects are receiving the intervention. You will know if you have a navigator or not. The control group is not um, no intervention, it's a usual care. And so it built into all our transition programs, we have a usual pitter patter of you know, some educational materials, some uh, orientations, uh, whatever. So that is unchanged, but it's, it's subtly different. It's, it's taking what we are doing now and asking whether layering on a navigator um, makes a difference. It's very interesting. I'm talking with my hands, even though you can't see me here. The, um, 
And um, the outcome measures here, what is the primary endpoint of this um, study? And, and what's, what I really like about this study is that they have um, done something that you cannot argue with. It's um, uh, and utilizing provincial databases, part of the consent process will, from, the, from the participants will be a permission to access the da provincial databases. They're going to count the number of ER visits and urgent care visits. And the hypothesis is that if you know how to navigate the system, you'll get better management of your um, uh, chronic illness and you will not be in the ER or emergency room as, uh, or urgent care as much. Secondary endpoints will be ambulatory and inpatient admissions, including ICU stays and length of stays. As I mentioned, uh, the, uh, un, uh, the, there'll be use of what's called a transition readiness assessment questionnaire, a track, uh, abbreviated track. 29 questions, grade five and a half reading level uh, takes five minutes and it's done at uh, planned time points. Similarly, a, a validated, and I'm emphasizing the word validated because you can't just make these questions up. These are uh, validated tools of 12 questions that address um, physical functioning, pain, health perception, social functioning, uh, general emotional and mental health. So it's a, a wellness tool. And then um, included is um, a detailed costing of the navigators and then um, a, a much higher level costing of the healthcare utilization uh, using um, uh, economic tools. Um, important in this um, um, is that there's a, um, there's an, in the design of this is they took um, sort of best practices for pragmatic and, and um, phase, uh, phase, conventional phase three trials and developed a consort plot. And so this is a plan um, to track all the patients that you considered for a, uh, for a trial and who got screened out, who um, fell out at different time points, how many did you need to randomize to get to your um, target goal. Why this is important is that this um, identifies biases that can get built into even a phase three trial and is incredibly important in the pragmatic trials so that you don't just skew the um, really, you know, um, excited practice that really already is doing a good job or a practice that is, isn't doing anything at all. That You get a a balance and then you find out who is coming off when and where. So in walking through the top here, um, they have, this is a publication saying, this is what I'm planning to do publication. Um, and so they, when they're starting, they don't know how many they're gonna need to assess for eligibility, but their target, if you read down, is um, to randomize um, 600 uh, participants. They're gonna be allocated one-to-one um, and, and the plan is to do a uh, baseline interview and then a um, end of study interview. The, I don't know why they have 100 here, to be honest with you. But the idea, so then when they're getting ready to publish their uh, findings, they're going to say, this is what I plan to do and here's what I actually ended up doing. So you can see how, how far this, um, this strayed from the plan and the plan is to have 300 analyzable patients uh, in each arm. Um, with this kind of, uh, with a study such as this, uh, um, the other theme is as you're designing it is to understand your project timeline and your plan. And so this is also called the Gantt chart. Um, uh, got, sorry for the typo there. Um, the, um, and named after a man, Henry Gant, who uh, did his work in the early 1900s um, in, and basically has become uh, the, um, part of the, the uh, heart of uh, project management. Uh, so you need to show to your funders and, and to your REB and to your patients, I'm going to accrue over X amount of time. I'm going to ha have my patient navigator intervention over Y amount of time here's uh, where my interviews are going to happen, and then wh what is my um, uh, knowledge translation and um, uh, plan. 
so that you can, um, um, you know, you, you set yourself um, uh, guidelines. So much like a more basic science grant, you're, you're going to want to show that you've got chops in this area, okay? And then what happens before this uh, chart starts is getting things through the REB, um, training of everybody, hiring, and so the um, it's a um, um, sort of adding structure to your trial. Now this trial I showed you look look dirt simple. Does having a navigator make your life better? Okay, the, you're probably not going to get a simpler uh, question. This shows the the careful attention that these inve investigators paid to understanding the stakeholders who's involved um, and making sure that they're engaging stakeholders, people who are going to understand and use this, prag this pragmatic information. And key here is more than just lip service, like active involvement of patient and family advisories. They were part of focus groups in the development of, of, this, of the uh, proposed uh, research active involvement of Alberta Health Systems um, services, both, uh, they're the holders of the databases um, uh, that will be, be pivotal as the end point, but they're also going to be the people who use this information and make a decision whether or not um, you're, uh, this is going to change, you know, change care. Um, there's an uh, executive committee, which is the principal investigator, pro uh, project coordinators, importantly, an external scientific advisory, people who are not, have nothing to do with this study, but who have either lived, walked the walk, or have good basic understanding of the issues involved to uh, pr be providing oversight. The clinical trial box is not just the, the person who had the great idea. You got methodologists, a health economist, a quality research chair, biostatistician. Um, you've got the trial management team, clinical research associates. You've got um, a data analysis team. You've got a whole lot of people who are stakeholders in, in wanting to understand this process. So this means, in this case, both adult and pediatric pediat uh, physicians who are involved taking care of chronically ill patients. Um, other stakeholders include CIHR, um, um, Alberta, uh, CHRI, uh, uh, and various fun foundations. So what looks like a simple study actually is pretty darn complex. In addition, not mentioned, uh, not shown here, is that there is a, an external data safety monitoring board, which is independent from the investigators, um, who will meet twice a, twice a year. So just getting across the complexity of doing what's a pragmatic question, uh, pragmatic trial. This is probably the best written plan that I've seen. Um, and um, and th these are their strengths and weaknesses that they included in, in the publication, the, pre the I'm planning to do this study publication. Um, the, major strength here is this is a population-based sample from one province with a universal health coverage. So the, well over 99% of ER visits and patient um, uh, care costs are covered. Um, the pragmatic randomized control trial has broad inclusion and has an intervention in, embedded in a real world healthcare setting. Here's what I like. The participants are not blinded to the treatment arms, but they are blinded to the primary outcome. Okay, so they're not going to be told that the primary outcome is number of ER uh, visits. Okay, they're, in fact, if I were them, I'd be, you know, if I was doing this, I, I would be thinking the primary outcome is that I'm happier with that based on that, as, uh, on the uh, tests, the, the forms that I'm filling out. So this is a cute, uh, as a, a clever way of building in a blinded outcome in a non-blinded trial. There is, the risks here is that there are, there are already some pretty good clinic-based interventions that prepare patients for trans, trans, transition that may duplicate some of the services that, that are um, uh, offered by the navigator. So that might decrease the chance of finding a positive signal 
with the navigator. Um, and they're um, um, worried too that the, um, with this sample size, uh, to keep pa uh, patients, uh, participants on the study for uh, the length of time uh, may be a challenge that they're not going to have drop off. Um, so the, um, 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 so they have a plan to have a, a planned engagement newsletter, email communications, um, use of um, uh, various communication tools. Um, and so, so that's, for me, that's a um, uh, sort of an example of the complexities of what's involved in developing a, a, what looks like it should be a very simple trial. The importance of stakeholders, the importance of patient uh, in, uh, participant engagement. Moving more towards, I think, what a number of us spend more of our time with, uh, if you're in the laboratory, you're developing a novel cell drug therapy, something that you think is going to make transplant um, safer. So ISIS was, is working on improving uh, organ preservation. And, and, you know, he's got, you know, let's say maybe he's doing some kind of warm storage and pre-treating the graft with something that makes it less inflamed and potentially, you know, um, um, better tolerated. For us, we are dealing with cell therapies. Um, uh, the CAR-Ts are an example. Um, uh, we have um, um, ways of improving uh, or that we think will improve um, either the transplant, the bone marrow transplant process or uh, treat some of the complications such as graft versus host disease. And in I have a bright idea. So say I have a bright idea that, um, yeah, I can just, the one I was dealing with last week was interleukin-2 and a low dose to uh, treat chronic graft-versus-host disease. With this bright idea, how do I get this into uh, early phase uh, trials? And so here's where it gets tricky because a lot of our, our early phase trial designs are not meant for um, cellular slash tissue slash graft applications. A lot of these um, uh, trials were designed to find, you know, what's the safe dosing for a drug, Tylenol, uh, uh, chemotherapy drugs. And so the premise here is that in general, more is better um, and that you start your dose finding by taking what you use to treat a monkey or a mouse, doing a calculation. And for the first in human, we start, you know, you know, you know much lower and, and, and go until we start, you know, increase dosing and yet on a patient by patient until we get close to what we think um, will be um, the, the, tr the treatment dose. That we then would go into a phase one trial where we're trying to find um, the dose that is safe um, and is likely to be eff efficacious. So historically, we've done something called a three by three plus three design, straight out, straight, no guff about it, um, developed uh, for chemotherapy. So we treat three patients with a dose. Um, if um, there's no toxicity, we take the dose level up to, uh, we, we increase the dose to dose level two. If there's toxicity, we take it down to dose level minus one. Um, and then uh, we, um, uh, if the, one patient has a side effect, we'll accrue to, it will accrue to a total of six patients to make sure that we're not seeing more than two out of six uh, having toxicity. So that has been Honestly, since uh, so you can't see me, but I, I'm, I've got a fair amount of gray on my head. Um, you know, for 30 years, that's been the uh, trial design. Um, the problem with it is that you um, the there's a lot of starting and stopping with this design because you accrue three patients and then you have to wait till you make sure they don't have side effects or or problems, um, and then you. Um, um, and then, and so 
it's very hard if you're doing something like a kidney transplant or if you're doing a bone marrow transplant to have starts and stops in, in, in the, in, during the trials. Um, and also very difficult to find that um, right dose. And there's a, um, a, um, a lot of work that's going on in, can we be smarter about how we um, come up with our dosing schedules? Uh, our planned doses, um, and so we're uh, so the using um, um, uh, newer statistical modeling to identify uh, smarter dose escalation plans. Um, this um, table here is is, is showing um, dose levels uh, on the x-axis and on the y. Uh, the probability of hitting a, a toxicity. Okay, in general, we'll accept a, somewhere between 25 to 30 percent um, stopping uh, dose limiting toxi uh, 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 toxicity that we'll, ac we'll accept in certain circumstances, depending what the toxicity is, uh, you can go up to about 50 percent. But you want to hit it so that your planned dose escalations in your in your early phase study straddle what you are anticipating is going to be the uh, maximally tolerated dose so in the in panel a you can see the the dose calculation this the uh, planned dose escalations were all well below the maximum tolerated dose um, and this study will fail because it's it's not going to you know it's not going you're you're at risk at your higher do highest dose level of not hitting your maximum tolerated dose, if that is in fact what you really need to do. Uh, the B panel shows your, your starting dose being too high and you're going to close your study pretty much immediately because your first patients are, are going to have toxicity. The tricky part here in these small number, small accrual studies is that if you have too big a gap between your, your planned dosing, you've got a good chance of coming up with a dosing. Um, if you say dose level four is too high, you then take it back down to dose level three. You're going to end up underdosing your patients as your treatment dose on your, your next level of studies, your phase two efficacy trials. So ideally, you want to be able to know, to come up, uh, to come up with a dosing strategy that nicely um, strat straddles the, um, the dosings that you're anticipating. So this is where the um, continuous reassessment models that take the, I treated this, the, my first three patients here, there, there's no, not a whisper of toxicity. I can move my dosing along more rapidly. I can um, continue to accrue at, um, uh, uh, dose levels. If I'm treating some, you know, if I got somebody who is not going to get a transplant, uh, it is never going to get go to kidney transplant unless I use this organ. I don't want to say, well, wait a minute, I'm close to accrual on the arm at this time. I want to be able to treat that patient, and I want to be able to use their data to build uh, the model and predict what, you know, how many patients I need to accrue at, at which dose level. And those, those are the newer Bayesian um, trial designs that, that involve um, it's, uh, a continuous reassessment modeling through the course of the trial. And, and regulators are now understanding this strategy better. Um, docs are now understanding this strategy better because we, we, we knew the three plus three design. And what is involved now is a more, uh, the, the, the trial design process now involves um, sitting down novel with the statistician, coming up with what's our tolerated toxicity? What do we expect? Is, and we're expecting liver toxicity, we're expecting, you know, um, graft failure, whatever. Um, and to, to, to know what, you know, what our thresholds are to start with a dose level, to start with a best guess at what the maximum tolerated dose is going to be. In pediatrics, we start at 80% of the adult tolerated do dose in general. 
although now increasingly the regulators are letting us start closer to, to uh, the adult dose. And a feel for the maximum tol uh, uh, sample size. So here's where the statistician um, uh, can um, start modeling um, and run through a thousand potential scenarios and they'll develop a, a skeleton um, and um, uh, proposed drug uh, dose levels. Uh, there's a rehuddle and then um, and then specify uh, the you know re, re Re, um, uh, re review it, develop, more for, formalize the cohort size, and then let the computer run through Mar Monte Carlo assessments, playing out you know, 1,000 to 5,000 trial scenarios for uh, various dose toxicities, and then uh, make a, 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 um, a proposed plan to take forward. So, this is a much more um, um, refined strategy rather than saying I'm going to go three plus three, I'm going to start with dose level one mg per kg, then to two, then to four, uh, which is how we have previously done. Now the problem is is that even if we do these um, models that, that honestly are designed for cytotoxic chemotherapy, they often do not make sense um, in our um, um, in our clinical um, in, in our business, where our endpoints may not be evident for years, and that's survival of organs, um, where we are not just a, you know, three weeks of treatment, we're talking about dosing for years and, and maybe even lifetime. Um, and, and, and the biggest thing for me is the maximum tolerated dose is not what we want. We want to shut off IL-2 production. We want to um, uh, have a pharmacodynamic uh, response. And so this is, this is where um, it, there's still a lot of work for people to do. And the nice thing about it is Health Canada is willing to listen uh, in their clinical trial assessments. Uh, the statisticians are, 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 um, um, have a good, uh, you know, are, are, are getting very savvy with, with modeling and there's still a lot of work to do. Okay, I'm going to switch gears for the last time here and, and uh, just tell you a little bit about the, the study that we're very excited about. Um, and um, with uh, our CDTRP trial with, um, uh, that we're doing. So just as a quick refresher, because I think a lot of people are solid organ transplants. Uh, in bone marrow transplant, our organ is the bone marrow. It's, um, and what we transplant are the uh, stem cells, the hematopoietic progenitors, um, that will um, give all parts of the blood, the red blood cells, platelets, and the white blood cells, but also the T cells. So we are flipping out the immune system. Um, we also have, have, as part of our process, we've got the thymus um, that gets populated by these T cells. Additionally, some of these T cells are expanded peripherally uh, and since T cells live for decades, they give uh, they, the, the T cells that are in the graft, as well as the hemato, uh, as well as those that develop off the hematopoietic stem cells, are contributing to the immune system. Different between our our practices is we don't care about the ABO. You care about the ABO. We care about um, HLA matching more than you do. I know you do care about. It. Our biggest problem is graft versus host disease, and that's where the donor T cells get uh, activated, expand up, and um, uh, go after the body, targeting um, uh, targeting skin, liver, gut predominantly, but also affecting the immune system in many ways. Um, and we are learning uh, more and more about it, but in general, our patients are able to come off immune suppression somewhere between you know, 100 days and you know, um, a couple of years post-transplant, there are a few patients who are um, longer lived. We have a curious thing that, that happens, and that is in bone marrow transplant, we will sometimes see something called stable mixed chimerism. It's more commonly seen in children, 
and it's more commonly seen when we use less intensive uh, hematopoietic stem cell preparative regimen. It's where we have blood making simultaneously um, uh, coming up from both the uh, donor and the recipient. They have gotten used to each other and we've got uh, stable blood making. We're very much interested in understanding the, uh, the mechanism of two immune systems um, which see differences in each other. How are they maintaining that tolerance when we're off immune suppression? Okay, and so the questions we have is, is this tolerance achieved by clonal deletion? Uh, is this something that the thymus is, thymus is doing or is it uh, happening peripherally? Um, or is it caused by immune uh, regulatory cells? Um, uh, deletion, I, I, I did it up here, sorry. Um, uh, energy, meaning it, there's signals to say, hey, T cells don't get excited. Um, do we have an active process? Do we have more regulatory cells? Uh, or is this a very specific, is this a, a, an innate type response or is this a specific um, antigens, uh, antigen specific response? So um, this is the, uh, what I warmly call uh, the state of Zen. Um, patients who have stable mixed chimerism, off immune suppression, not showing any graft versus host disease. The concept here is that if we can understand this state of Zen and know, uh, know what's involved, that we'll, we'll have clues for sol uh, the development of solid organ tolerance, that we'll have clues on how what we should, what we could target if we were thinking of doing a uh, some sort of uh, transplant from the do uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant from the donor, um, as well as the uh, as the solid organ. Um, and so the hypothesis is that children with mixed chimeras post. Uh, mixed hematologic chimeras post allo transplant uh, will be a model for, um, for transplant and to determine uh, mechanisms of tolerance. It's a cross-sectional pan-Canadian study. So cross-sectional meaning we're taking one time point in the lives of kids who are, um, have stable mixed chimera. It's an exploratory study. We're, we're just trying to get, get our sea legs. We have no idea what we're going, we're going to find. Um, and uh, the eligibility are children who are, uh, have received an allogeneic transplant for either malignant or non-malignant diseases um, and uh, some control kids um, just for what normal is. Um, uh, their patients um, greater than a year post-transplant uh, who have stable mixed chimerism, so we need them to have two um, uh, stable ver values. And I've had kids uh, you know, over a decade post-transplant, staying 50-50 donor recipient blood making, no infections because we're trying to understand what the immune system is doing. So we don't want the uh, the changes that happen with an acute viral infection. Uh, no graft versus host disease. We've got three groups, um, uh, roughly 40 patients per group, looking at patients who are full donor chimeras and uh, patients who are somewhere in between, and those. Uh, children who have not been transplanted. A lot of controls need to be built in because of um, the thymus is a variable for us. Um, and um, uh, as part of this, we just get their past history. And uh, the nice thing about this study, it's a one-time blood draw. And we're looking, we got, we got some cute questions here. We're very excited about them. One is, a lot of our patients were crossing ABO barriers. Um, I know it just doesn't feel well right for you guys, but um, um, we routinely cross the barriers. So I've got two hematopoietic cell stem cell lineages pumping out young blood making cells. What happens to both the expression of red cell antigens, uh, ABO antigens on the red cells, and what happens to the anti-ABO antibodies? And so we just happened to have a ringer in the CDTRP with the West team uh, uh, in uh, developing uh, who has the uh, panels for uh, ABO ant uh, antibodies 
and uh, we have set up uh, flow cytometry for uh, actually measuring the, you know, what kind of red cells you've, you're making. Uh, we're interested in uh, sort of using the um, uh, immune panels that uh, C CDRTP, uh, Megan Levings and others, the Duraclone tubes will get sort of just a good baseline understanding of four kids who are making who are in this state of Zen, what, what does their immune profile look like? Um, we have the ability in, even in our perfectly matched uh, sibling transplants, um, about 80% eight, of them are perfectly matched, but they will not match at DP because DP, if you look at, at the uh, HLA gene is sitting way out about two miles down the genome. And there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in DP. So we, potentially have um, a tool to, to measure what, you know, what, what are patients doing with this um, antigen difference. And we're looking um, at the phenotype of the whole immune system, but also uh, uh, very excited about being able to use single cell RNA-seq to identify at a single cell level immune cells that are coming from the donor and the recipient and looking to say for recipients or donors, um, do I, um, um, am I, is the host immune system looking, doing something different than the uh, recipients, uh, the donor's immune system? And, um, and so this is, um, you know, it's a bit of a, a reach kind of um, um, question, but we're, the potential power here is that we can then use that to inform what you know, where we should be going as we try to design smarter tolerance packages uh, for solid organ transplant. This has uh, been a, a headache for uh, Dave Hartel. Um, it, there's a lot of moving parts similar to the other study that I just got described. This is, a, you know, just draw a blood sample. How hard can it be study? Um, and, but it involves many teams. Um, my colleague doesn't know how to spell Winnipeg. Um, the, uh, and uh, several labs across the country. And um, we're finally uh, get, uh, ready to enroll the first patients and, and run our first assays. So uh, this is the team. And, and I think this is the, my wrap up slide. So I just thank you for this opportunity to talk. And hopefully I just kind of gave you a little tasting menu for some of the things we think about in clinical design uh, trials um, and, uh, and with a focus on overlap between um, uh, solid organ um, and uh, bone marrow transplant.